Welcome to episode 141 of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And I have a couple quick things I want to share before we start our great interview. First, it's been a few weeks since I last posted one of our episodes, and I've had lots of listeners email and message me hoping that I'm okay. So the truth is I'm fine. I have a little bit of a cold, but I also have a day job that you might not know about. My mom and I own a catering business and we work with race car teams. And so if you don't hear from me for a couple of weeks, I'm away at one of the races. We cooked in Daytona is what we, where we were for almost um, 1300 people per meal uh, for a couple of weeks at the Daytona Speedway. So no worries. I will always, as long as I'm on this planet, uh, return and give you some good episodes. And second, I am now at a point where there's a lot of emails coming into me and I'm grateful to you for listening. Super grateful. But if you are somebody who's emailed me and I haven't gotten back to you, I apologize. I'm doing my best too. Um, we've hit the point where we have over 2,000 listeners a day that download an episode and just know that I'm busy. But please know I read every single email that you send. So thank you for that. And last, some exciting news. Many people have wondered when we can all meet and get together face to face. There is an afterlife conference coming up that I want to invite you to. It's in Scottsdale, Arizona, September 15th through 17th, 2017, and it's hosted by the Afterlife Research and Education Institute. They have asked me to be one of their speakers, and of course I said yes, and I'd love to meet you there. If you want to find out more information, you can go to afterlifestudies.org. And you can find out more. Lots of big speakers and uh, big people in afterlife will be there. Now, on to the show. Our guest today is my friend, Victoria Santo, a spiritual medium. She has studied mediumship with some of the best mediums in the world and is featured on Bob Olson's Best Psychic Directory, which means she's good. I saw Victoria a few months ago in a demonstration in front of an audience. She's a great medium. She's caring. She's got a great sense of humor, and I am thrilled to have her to talk to on the show today. Her website is victoriasanto.com, and there's a K in her name as opposed to C in Victoria. And without further ado, Victoria, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for having me. Oh. I really appreciate yes, it. Yes, we met a few months ago, and I remember it was your birthday. Yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> gave you a copy of my book, and then I was thrilled that you got up in front of the audience and you did a uh, demonstration of mediumship. And I tell you what, you made me laugh, and I don't know if um, there's often humor in your demonstrations and your readings but it it was just so so refreshing that um i think those on the other side can have a sense of humor yes absolutely you know i find sandra that sometimes um people are so grief stricken and they are so um heavy in their emotions that the best way to help healing is by lightening up everything and you know, it, it can be just very simply uh, saying a joke or something that uh, they really wanted to share as a fun memory. And that can very quickly lighten the mood of the person. And then they become more receptive of um, the messages and the healing that the spirit loved ones are trying to send their way. Mm, I'll never forget it because it was a, a woman, a man that you brought through for a, a woman who was grieving the loss of her significant other. And you saw him in a Speedo yes. swimsuit. And I, I didn't see that coming. And I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> That is that is funny, but afterwards I did talk to her, and she said that they did have some private joke about uh, speed. Yes, so, it was, um, and you gave obviously a lot more uh, pertinent information, and really I could tell by her face that you knew exactly you were speaking to exactly who she was looking to connect with. So there was no doubt in my mind. Um, that you had him, but it just, it made me laugh. Yes. So Victoria, tell us a little bit about you. You you don't have an American accent. Where are you from originally? 
I'm originally from Hungary. I did grow up in Hungary. And at that time, uh, it was still pretty much the communist system. So it was a very different era. And I was about 20 years old when I decided to um, go work on a cruise ship. It was an opportunity that came very quickly out of the blue. Um, and I just thought, well, why not? Right. So the first 20 years I did spend in Hungary and even though my accent maybe is not as heavy and thick as someone who um, is in Hungary, I definitely still have an accent. <laughs> well, you're charming, so no problem. And how long have you been in the United States? Well, it's been almost 20 years now. Not necessarily in the United States, away from home. Mm -hmm. um, after I left the cruise ship, I lived in the Cayman Islands for eight years. Nice. And I've been here in the U.S. for a little over 10 years now. And you're so. in Nebraska? Yes, I'm in Nebraska. Married with children? Married with children. You know, it's funny because after we left the Cayman Islands, my husband told me that we're moving to Omaha where he is from. And I didn't know Omaha. And, and he said, you know, you're going to love it. Omaha is the best kept secret in the world. Really? And yes, 10 years into it, I'm still trying to figure the secret out. So Funny. <laughs> lots of cows, lots of flat lambs. Yes. Nice people. Corn, yes. Corn? Corn, yes. Cows and nice people, yes. And you. <laughs> and me. <laughs> I was on your website, and you uh, do some public speaking and um, mediumship demonstrations, and I thought, oh, that's great. So if people are in the Nebraska area, they can actually see you. Oh, absolutely. And I do travel quite a bit, um, mostly in Iowa at this point. And then I go different places in Nebraska. And I do work sometimes with um, another medium here in Omaha, a friend of mine. And we do demonstrations quite a bit. And I also do private readings, of course. Mm -hmm. But I, I am very... Um, I find it very enjoyable to speak in front of people and bring people together this way. Yeah, I think so. Do you work with small groups of people? Like if somebody wanted you to come in the house and there's eight of us, that's what, something you do? Yes, I do too. Yes, um, small family or small friend groups. Um, I do that quite often as well. Hmm, very good. And through the magic of Skype and telephone, I, yes. I saw on your website you've talked to people from... I don't even remember where, Europe, Australia, all over the world. Yes, yes. It's amazing, you know, how connected we are. 20 years ago, um, I don't know, I don't even think we had much knowledge of the internet, no. maybe a little bit, but not to this extent. It's, no. it's quite amazing. We're very lucky, very lucky. Yeah, and you don't need to be face-to-face -face with someone to be able to get the messages. So let's back up. How did you get into this world of life after death? Oh, well, this is kind of an interesting story. You know, growing up in Hungary, um, in the communist system, religion, spirituality wasn't encouraged at all. So I grew up in a home um, pretty much without any kind of spiritual or religious influence. Wow. And... I do remember when I was about four years old, my grandparents always had cats and sometimes they had kittens and I just love spending time with, you know, the cats and kittens. And I remember um, one time I was petting the kittens and I kept thinking what these kittens were before they were born cats. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had no knowledge about reincarnation or anything like that. But it just was so obvious to me that they were something else before they were cats. So I didn't mention that to my parents because <laughs> they really weren't into anything like mm -hmm. that. But it just kind of stayed with me. And, and I always been open to these experiences. But Growing up, I didn't really have anything. You know, I had a couple of 
instances where I would hear talking and I was quite terrified to be honest you know but I just hear talking at night and I wouldn't know who that is and things like that but I didn't grow up like seeing that people and when I was in my 20s and living in the Cayman Islands uh, in 2004 Hurricane Ivan hit the island and that was a category 5 hurricane wow and it completely destroyed it. And it was very hard for me um, seeing all the devastation. I felt um, physically sick from seeing, you know, everything is gone, really. And on top of it, we didn't have running water for about two weeks. We didn't have electricity for five. Wow. And that was, you know, a time where I felt I really needed something to ground me because I felt so, I felt all the feelings of people and, and the devastation and I just felt like I'm going to lose it. So I somehow came across uh, something online and that was uh, about 20 minutes relaxation by the Silva Method. I don't know if you're familiar with the Silva method, but it's basically a mind training program. Okay. And I was just listening to this uh, full body relaxation. And then you kind of program your mind to um, find this relaxing and quiet place within you very easily. So that's kind of all it is. And I started doing this because I felt... I really needed something to ground me within the chaos that was going through on the outside world. And I found that just within a couple of days of starting to do that, it had such an impact on me. It calmed me down so much and I felt a lot more at peace. And I thought, I have to look into this a little bit more. So... In 2005, there was a training available in Tampa, I believe, and that was a three days uh, Silva Mind training or Silva Mind Mind Control training. And at the end of that three days, somehow my psychic abilities just opened up. Um, I came to start doing psychometry, which is you hold an object and you get information out of the object. And I, I was able to do so many things with that and read people. And I just found myself completely amazed by this whole new world of what is possible. So that's kind of how it started. And I started to have all sorts of experiences with um connecting with my spirit guides, which I didn't even know we had spirit guides. And then I had a couple of out-of-body experiences that we also call astral travel. And it's not a near-death experience. I had no um, physical issues, anything. It's an induced, willful out-of-body experience. And all these things propelled me to... Um, explore more and more wow. and then basically I, I, before we're done with this episode i want you to explain a couple of those things you just mentioned um maybe we do it now is that all right sure yeah maybe first psychometry can you give an example of what you would mean by psychometry uh, even if it, it, it relies to uh you know somebody in the life after death i mean can you tie it in with someone who's deceased Yes, um, I can give you two examples okay. that are very different but very interesting. So I started working after all this happened with a psychic detective um, doing online courses. And so what she would do sometimes, uh, she would go to, um, and she was an actively working psychic detective, so she would go to some crime scenes and she would pick up rocks that would be close to the crime scene and she would mail them to us. Now, we wouldn't know anything about it other than, you know, this is part of a crime scene. And then once we had the rock, 
we would be just quieting our mind, holding the rock. Normally, you hold the rock in your non-dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, you will hold it in your left Hmm. and the other way around. And so you just kind of hold the rock and close your eyes and see if you start getting any thoughts, feelings, sometimes images that pop in your mind. And it is very important that you just let whatever to come to you. You don't try to see. You don't try to like, oh, what is this that I'm seeing? You just allow it to unfold is basically what you do. And so this way, you know, you're able to describe what's around the crime scene, whether you see trees or a gravel road or a house, whatever it is. Sometimes, believe it or not, even the emotions are edged in the rock. Hmm. So you can start feeling like, oh, there was an argument here or, or whatever happened there. You get a sense of what it is because inanimate objects store energy. Everything is energy around us. And when there's, especially when there's high emotions, like, you know, any kind of fear, anger, or or joy and happiness, Mm -hmm. any high emotion can um, get stored in these inanimate objects. And that's basically what a psychic reads. Hmm. And were you able to tell uh, much holding the rocks from the uh, crime scene? Yes, yes. I was able to, surprisingly, I was able to say quite a few things about it. Now, another example, and that was something very new for me. Mm -hmm. Um, When I was doing all this, I also told my husband a couple of times that on his way home from work, he needs to stop someplace and pick up a rock and then bring it home to me, (laughs) and then I can just hold it and see what's around it and tell him where he got the rock from. Really? So, yes, yes. And one time I would see, let's say, you know, I I kind of just kept seeing people's legs, and I knew they sitting somewhere, and I just had a sense of it's a restaurant, and all I saw is people's legs under the table. Mm -hmm. And he said it was a restaurant outside with a lot of terrace. So that was interesting. But in that one particular time, I had him pick up a rock. And as soon as I held that rock, I had that sense that this rock is upset with me. And I thought, oh, I must be making this up. That's How weird. This yes. rock be, be upset, upset with, with you. Me? Sure. And it didn't want to talk to me. So I, I said in my mind, okay, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what's your problem. Can we talk about this? <laughs> and I basically had that feeling that this rock was upset because it was next to a tree. And the tree and this rock have been friends for lack of, you know, other expression. And I had to promise the rock that I will put it back where I, where my husband found it after I get all the impressions. And after that, I was able to say everything that was around them. The, there was a lot of bridge. It was right next to the road um, and all the lot of details around. So when I told my husband, he said, yes, that's where I found the rock. And yes, there's a lot of bridge. There's a lot of creek and everything that I picked up. So I said, okay, that is great. But now you will need to take this rock back because (laughs) this rock is upset. (laughs) So my husband looked at me a little bit you know, sideways, but like you're crazy. Yes, but he did it rock back. Exactly. But afterwards, I kept thinking like, I didn't even think that this would be possible. And of course, you know, a rock will not have full range of emotions like a human does. But there was something that this tree and the rock were, I don't know, close in in some ways. And that was really unique for yeah, me. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think of plants and things like that having living energy and things, but never thought of a rock. 
I know that was the same way for me. I knew about plants, but uh -huh. a rock. So now I look at rocks a little bit differently. And my children, especially when they were younger, they would love to pick up rocks from here and there. So now I always tell them, you can pick them up, but ask them if they're okay with it. <laughs> Yo, you're funny. So, so, so my kids are doing that now. Mm -hmm. Are you sure he's okay with that? And it's like, yes, all right, then we can take it. <laughs> that, how old are your kids? Um, the younger one is eight, the older one is 10 now. Oh, sweet. Okay, now I want to hear about connecting with your spirit guides. So you started out with psychometry and you were practicing all this. And um, we've talked quite a bit about spirit guides. And how did you know from not knowing that there's such thing as spirit guides to now knowing that you have them and they're talking to you? You know, it was one of these, I think a lot of things in my life would be considered beginner's luck. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever sat down with the intention of I'm going to connect with my spirit guides. Right. It was more like I was in this very relaxed um, space. I was doing my, you know, full body relaxation. And I find that sometimes when I get into this altered state, there is, it's almost like I can hear like there's a click, there's a, there's some kind of a shift. And that's exactly what happened. All of a sudden, I just felt like there's a click. And I was in a scene. It looked like I was in like a beautiful meadow of some kind. And there were some beings there and they were wearing white robes now bear it in mind i don't have any preconceived thoughts about what guides look like so i wasn't sure who these beings are mm -hmm. and then someone led me to what looked like a door um it was a wooden door which was odd but someone led me there and a little boy opened the door for me and held my hand and kept guiding me to, um, I don't know, to this place that looked, it was just so beautiful. It looked like a beautiful garden. And there I had a man waiting for me. And I don't really remember how he looked like. I, I can see his face very clearly, but I don't remember whether he had a robe or anything, you know, of that sort on. But what was so interesting that his face looked quite old, yet his eyes looked very young and full of love and full of joy. It, it was very striking how his face was old, but his eyes were very young. And somehow he communicated to me that he is there to guide me and help me. And anytime I need guidance, I'm welcome to come back to this place. So that was my first experience. And I came out of it and I was like, wow, what it just happened, mm -hmm. you know, and and I kind of started to build this connection with this guy. Now I still don't know his name, so I I just call him my main guide because I've never gotten a name from him. But I did get a sense of the name is not important. Mm -hmm. If I want to give him a name, that's fine. But it is really not important. And then a couple of months after this first. Um, experience with the guide. I was just doing my meditation and I imagined I'm in a beautiful scene and the guide popped in um, somewhat uninvited. I wasn't thinking about connecting. And it was just a very quick popping in and they said, I have a lot of change coming my way, but don't worry, we'll be here with you. And that was it. So I was like, what changed? I don't like unexpected changes. Mm -hmm. so what changed? What changed? And they would not say anything. And that was the end of the experience. And about a month later, I got pregnant with our first daughter, um, although it wasn't really planned. So if they told me, oh, you're going to be pregnant, I probably would have done everything I can not to because I didn't feel ready. Right. Now, looking back, of course, I was ready, but um, 
So that's probably why they didn't say what the change was, but they wanted to let me know that there's going to be a lot of change and that they are there with me. That's so. great. And I love how they showed up. It wasn't, I've done some uh, relaxation techniques and you put yourself in your mind's eye, whether you're on a beach or in a park, and then you imagine a, um, a park bench and then you invite someone to sit with you. And But it's all kind of, like we're creating it and and true it could be a guide or a deceased loved one that sits with you but i love how you were just relaxed and in they came and say yes. they're there so yes that's interesting so from there from there did you experience the out of body experiences was that the next or did you get into mediumship because i want to get into a little bit about why you believe in life after death yes and and i think that's kind of how it all happened okay. first first the guides and that just kind of intrigued me so much I started reading upon you know all these and making sure I didn't just go crazy or right. had some kind of a hallucination and that's how I came across um out of body experiences astral travel and there's a couple of sites where it would tell you how you can have a conscious out of body experience really which yes which means basically you do the same relaxation, you go through your whole body and, and you have to get to the point where you're so relaxed, your body falls asleep, yet your mind stays awake. Mm -hmm. And so I did try a couple of times and um, didn't get very far. And then at one morning, I thought, I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to try to do that. And that's how it happened. I literally felt I was very relaxed. And I started feeling like my legs are kind of above my physical legs and my arms are kind of crossed on my chest, whereas my physical arms were still, you know, right beside my body. Mm -hmm. So I started to feeling that separate, being separate from my physical body. And I started lifting up. However, for some reason, my... Um, I guess, astral head was stuck in my physical head. So I couldn't, I felt like my whole body was lifted up except my head. My mm -hmm. head was stuck in my head. So I just had to kind of try to wiggle myself out. And finally I did. And I somehow shot through space and I don't know how and where I ended up, but I ended up floating above a lake and I was so close to the surface I could see all the little ripples on the lake and I could then speed up and go faster and then slow down and I thought wow this is amazing and then I saw I looked around and I saw these beautiful trees with all the four colors I mean if I wanted to put it as to what it looked like I would say it's something like you know, the Hamptons or Maine mm -hmm. um, in in the fall time. And I, I just, I can't even describe the colors. There were so many beautiful colors we don't even have in the physical world. And I felt I was surrounded by this unconditional love. And I thought, oh my God, this is so beautiful. I, I just had this thought like, I don't know where I am, but I don't want to go back. And that thought put me right back in my body. And I was so upset for, you know, at least a week because I was like, I wish I didn't think that I could have stayed a bit longer over there, wherever it was. But that feeling of love and full acceptance for the being I am felt so strong that I, I've never experienced anything like that. Victoria, just I just want to say that I've talked to enough people who have had near-death experiences and even people have done the astral travel and they said that th you do see colors that are not anything we've ever seen before and also that feeling of unconditional love surrounding you is very, very much real. So I think that's really pretty cool. Um, it Was it vivid too? Is it like... Um, I mean, can you tell it's not a dream that you're, I mean, does it feel real? 
Oh, absolutely. It is. So what's interesting is that you are not aware that you're lying on the bed and your physical body is there. You're fully um, out of your body. So uh-huh. your consciousness is in that place. You okay. have no thoughts about the physical world or where you left your physical body. At that time, I was living in the Cayman Islands on the beach. I had two dogs. I had a beautiful life, yet I wasn't aware of any of that. I just thought, oh my God, this place is so beautiful. I don't want to come back to wherever I was before. So, and and I also, when I looked around and I saw the colors, um, I also saw above me what looked like, um, you know, the statue in Rio de Janeiro mm-hmm. called Christ the Redeemer? Yes. That's what I saw, but it was just out of colors. And those colors were like pulsing and very alive. And again, it was just, it's so hard to put it into words because those colors were not just vivid, but different colors than what we have here. Wow. And what was very striking to me is that I did not grow up religious. So for me, seeing this statue was very unusual. Yes. Uh, And it wasn't really the statue. It was just the statue shape out of the colors. But that's when I felt that unconditional love coming to me. Wow. Now... You know, the rest of my out-of-body experiences were, um, and ever since, and that was about 10 years ago, the rest of them were more like walking around in our home and, you know, just being very close to the earth space. So that's why I'm saying it might have been beginner's luck mm-hmm. to <laughs> went somewhere, you know, I, I can't go back there yet. But um, the rest of them is more closely related to the physical world. Okay. And then, now, did you ever have any deceased people walk in, or how did you get tied in with with being able to communicate with those in the hereafter? Well, all this, you know, started opening up a lot of uh, questions for me, things I didn't know existed. And I'm, I'm very much um, someone who likes to understand what's happening. Yes. And so while I was, this was also the time when I started working with the psychic detective. And she always said, we have to pick up clues psychically. So that's what we did. And then one time we were working on a case and I just wasn't getting anything and I was getting frustrated. So I finally just asked the deceased person who, um, it was a murder investigation, but I just said, what happened? And to my utter surprise, I started getting all this information from that woman. And I was like, wait a minute, am I talking to this deceased person? Uh So that was my aha moment of, I can just ask the person what happened. I don't have to pick up psychically. So from then on, I started to um, ask friends if I can connect with their loved ones. And I was still very much just testing this out because I wasn't sure if it was, again, just a beginner's luck right. or or what happened. But I found that I can consistently get information from these loved ones. Now, some are very communicative. I get a lot of information, some not so much. But I found that the ones who were very outgoing in life or very emotional, I can get a lot more on them than those who were very much like quiet, introvert people in life. So that's kind of how it started for me, just realizing that it's a possibility sure, to do communicate. You, do you have any examples of when you first started, when you were shocked that you... Um, you, you heard something in your mind or from one of these people and then whoever you were with validated it? Oh, yes. I do have uh, several examples. I would sometimes hear, um, and when I say I hear them, I don't hear them like someone's talking in my head. It really sounds like my own 
thought voice, you know, when you Uh talk to you in your own head. And so that's what I would hear. But I would hear very interesting things like um, this person had a horse that was very dear to them. And I kept seeing this person who I was uh, sitting with, her grandmother, and, and she kept bringing this horse up. And in my mind, I thought, a grandmother is not going to be riding a horse, but I kept seeing it. So I said, well, I don't know why, but I feel like you have your grandmother there and then there's a horse and she started bowling. And I was like, oh my God. So these were the first little glimpses of there is something that's possible here, you know, and, and it might not even be just a human being. It might be an animal who can communicate as well or you know what I mean Uh so this this was very interesting at the beginning Um, I also had um, that's again one of the first experiences is um, I had a lady who um, wanted to connect with some of her loved ones and as soon as she sat down in front of me I felt like I am her son and I just I, I just blurted out, I'm okay, mom. And it was all before I consciously could talk myself out of it. I just blurted it, I'm okay, mom. And she started sobbing and, and oh. it was her son who, who passed very recently, possibly a year before the reading. Uh-huh. And and he just really just wanted to say that he's okay, but the feeling was so overwhelming that for a second I felt like I am her son. So I think some of these experiences, especially at the beginning, serve to give you an idea as to what is possible. That's kind of like the carrot in front of your nose. Yes. And and that's what's going to help you to keep pushing and, and keep trying to find out more and keep you know, getting to that place where you become a clearer vessel for this energy to come through you. Mm. And then you started studying mediumship because you also went to the Arthur Finley College, correct? Yes, yes. I really think that we all have natural abilities. You know, some people say, oh, we're born with this. And maybe we are, but Mm -hmm. then if we are, then we all are. Right. Um, and I, I just have a strong feeling is that if you're called to explore, that there is a reason. And I felt that once I started having these experiences, I felt like I needed some understanding as to what this is and how this works. And, and that's why I decided to do the Arthur Findlay College and, and train with mediums. Because even if you have a natural ability for something, you still need practice and you still need training. Even if I was very good musically, if I don't train, I might not ever become a concert piano player. Right. I will be able to, you know, play small things. So I think that's the same with mediumship. We all have some abilities. Some people have possibly natural abilities, but you still need some training and guidance as to how to use this and how to um, take it to a deeper level. Mm. Victoria, did you ever have any fear of working with people when you first started or maybe when you started being paid as a medium? Did fear ever come into it? Can I do it? Can I do it? You know? (laughs) <laughs> well, I always feel a little bit of, you know, pressure, not mm-hmm. not because um, I can do it, but it's because I want to bring healing to that person. Yes. So at the beginning, I did put a lot of pressure on myself because I felt like they hear, even when I did them for free at the beginning, I felt like I need to um, produce something. Yes. And I felt that when I put myself in that uh, mind frame, I block what's coming through and I block the flow of information. So I've gotten to the point where I am just 
open to receive whatever they want to give me. I don't have a list of, you know, you need to give me this, you need to give me that or whatever it is. I just open it and I say to myself, okay, please bring me whatever information the person in front of me needs for their highest and best interest. And I just let it come, whatever comes. Whatever flows. You have a great... Uh, motto that you have on your website when ego steps in spirit steps out and I love that for many of the listeners know that I've dabbled in mediumship a little bit myself and I get so overwhelmed with can I do this is it gonna work uh, and and then fear shows up and then there's nothing there and then um, the last time I, I practiced uh, I didn't even have a choice in practicing. I was in a group and the leader said, okay, we're all going to do it. She called it the confident medium. And really, she says, just pretend you can do it. Put away the voice that says you can't. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, I delivered a, a good medium reading. So it just tells me when ego steps in, spirit steps out. When our own thinking gets involved, forget about it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it is so interesting because if you tell the person in front of you, if you, let's say, are having a private sitting, if you say, you know, I'm trying to um, not put pressure on myself, but I really want to have you to have a good reading, you just, you know, I think maybe if you are upfront with the person, then that kind of takes the pressure off you anyway. And I just feel that if you can just completely forget about I'm here and I have this person in front of me and they waiting to hear from, you know, their loved ones, and you just kind of almost like you don't care. Now, I know that sounds funny because, of course, you care. But if you can just let go of, you know, just almost like you imagine that, oh, I have this loved one here and and not care whether it's right or wrong, not right. care whether the person in front of you understands it or not. And if you can get to that point, some pretty amazing evidence will come through. <laughs> And I do believe that we all have this. And just like you say, you need to practice. You need to learn. You need to train. If this is something that sounds like a calling to you, um, follow up on it. Why not? Absolutely. And, you know, I always tell people the two most important things that you need to be a medium is to have thoughts and have feelings because those are the two main ways they communicate even if you cannot picture an orange in your head you still have thoughts and you have feelings and I think it's mostly through meditation or quieting your mind and watching your thoughts is when you start to learn to differentiate between what is your own thought and what comes from the spirit world and sometimes you know like how you just say whatever comes to you and you don't care whether it's right or wrong I recently had a phone conversation with someone who called to set up a reading and this man asked a couple of questions about am I psychic medium what's the difference and so I tried to explain it to him you know everyone is psychic but not everyone is a medium. So every psychic um, kind of is not a medium. Every medium will be a psychic, but not the other way around. So then he asked me, okay, so if you are a psychic, can you pick up um, about people who are close to me? And I said, yes, I can, or things that happen to them because I'm reading your energy field. And I said, well, if you have, an, let's say, an Uncle Joe who recently broke his foot, will that have any meaning to you? And what I was trying to get to is like, I'm going to pick up information from your energy field that's important to you. And all of a sudden, there's quiet in the phone. And he goes like, well, are you reading me now? And I said, no, why? He's like, well, I do have an Uncle Joe who recently broke his foot. Really? But, you know, it was just because I wasn't thinking about what I'm saying. It just came out. And it was 
right evidence and I didn't know it was until he told me. But then that also goes to show that, you know, a lot of times we think that our thoughts are own thoughts and maybe they are not. Maybe they are in some kind of, um, you know, information or Mm -hmm. impressions from the spirit world. But because they sound like our own thoughts, we just don't think anything of it. I love that with Uncle Joe and the broken foot. I know. It, it was really funny. And I, I think he probably was a bit scared about, you know, setting up a reading afterwards because, like, what else she's going to know? But it actually did go very well. Oh, I'm sure. You're so easy to talk to. And also, um, I applaud you for doing this. On your website and on YouTube, you have a couple of videos of you doing medium readings with a person. And I watched you for a little while this morning while I was getting ready for this interview. And I thought, you know, that's awesome because it's your style, how you work. Um, You don't want to know anything from the person you're sitting with, right? Yes, absolutely right. I find that the more you know, the more it gets in your way Mm -hmm. anyway. So it's, it's better not to know anything. And also, I am somewhat skeptical call myself believe it or not I need the evidence I need to know that I'm really getting this from the spirit world and not from the person in front of me so it is a lot easier for me if you just say yes no you're not sure and you don't have to say anything else if you don't want to Mm, but I saw by the tissue in one of the girl's hands that you were right on (laughs) Yes. And, you know, recently I started doing um, these readings on Facebook as well. I go Facebook live Do you? on my business page. And, you know, I have, I don't know, 50, 60 people watching and I just tune into someone I'm drawn to and give them a quick reading there. So I just started doing that. I've only done it twice so far, but I find it really interesting and and a lot of people get uh, benefits out of it so oh that's great um when we're done with the episode stay on the line for a little extra and i'll get your facebook information um and for our listener when you're listening this will all have happened already but if you go to we don't die radio.com and click on episode 141 i will have the links to victoria's website and her facebook and who knows what else we'll we'll have before this is over. Well, I really um, am interested and what's really appealing to me is that the access way through this to this whole world is when you started quieting your mind. And I think um, learning to do that and practicing for myself and others can really be the door way to so many things absolutely and i don't think that people understand what really meditation is because some people have a misconception that when you meditate you have to just have no thoughts you're just quietly sitting there and Mm -hmm. like maybe in a lotus position and that's it it really is not what this is about it's about witnessing the thoughts that are coming into your mind, just being there and observing them. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to shut them out. In fact, if you try to shut them out, it's like a pressure cooker. You you can keep it for a little while and then it just starts on and, and, and start going even more. So all you do is just, you almost like you fall behind you. And you just let whatever come, come. And it's such a beautiful practice because, you know, if you think about it in a very different way, life has been unfolding a very long time before we got here. Yes. And it will unfold most likely after we leave here. So we're really just here to experience for a short while And yet what we do is we go, oh, I don't like this. I want this. And I don't like it this way. And I don't like this person. Or why is this there? So instead of that, we could just enjoy and co-create with life and not say, 
I prefer this, I don't like this. You know, it's all in our mind. And with meditation, you start seeing that side of your mind. And you can just say, okay, well, this is what my mind is doing, but I don't have to go with that. And it's a very powerful feeling. Yes, it is. And it's interesting even bringing this up. I was in a kind of a bad mood earlier before we talked. And I forget, I mean, because we're all human, that, you, you know, your thoughts just happen. It's not like I purposely woke up on the wrong side of the bed. It just, it, they happen. But I don't, I can be the observer of them, step out and watch and not be that. Yes. And I think maybe your mind is doing that because, you know, I look at, I look at my mind as, um, maybe a machine. And that's, that's what the purpose of this machine is to generate these thoughts. And, and maybe it's generated these thoughts because there's some kind of a disturbance in my thoughts. Let's say if I tell you, um, don't wear that shirt, Sandra, because it's not a good shirt to wear to work. Uh You, your mind will go to why did she say that? Is it really my shirt? So your mind will go to that because your mind got disturbed. But you can just sit back and say, okay, mind, mind got disturbed for whatever reason. It's trying to work out whatever it has to work out. And I'm just going to watch it. It has nothing to do with me, with who I am in my being. I love that. The mind is just a machine. And it's going to keep working no matter what. Right? It will, yes. Wow. Looking at the time, we're going. this interview is going by very quickly. We had spoken a few minutes before we started recording. And you said something about spoon bending. Spoon bending. What in the heck <laughs> are you doing bending spoons? And I, I have a feeling you're going to get into the power of our mind. But what, <laughs> what are you doing with spoons? Well, you know, it's it's just a little exercise that sometimes I teach people. And believe it or not, it is all about allowing. This this is kind of the theme with, you know, where I am right now in my mm-hmm. life. It's learning allowing. Because I have seen several people, and some of them are uh, my friends as well, who've done this. And I thought, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to bend a spoon. So I went to the local thrift store, and I got a bunch of spoons. (laughs) And I asked them, my friend, like, what am I supposed to do? And they said, well, you just have to sit with the spoon and tell the spoon to bend. And you will be able to bend it. So I thought, "Mm, I don't know. So I did sit down with my spoon and I kept telling it to bend and I kept feeling really silly about this. Of course. And of course, nothing happened. And I got really frustrated. And then I emailed my friend and I said, well, it's not happening. What am I doing wrong? And he said, that you have to, after you put your intention on bending that spoon, you have to let go of that intention completely. And then you can bend it. Now, when I'm saying bending it, it's not like you're looking at it and it will start bending. It's basically, it gets, I don't know, it gets almost like rubbery. It feels very much like rubber, and then you use your arm to bend it. But it's not like you have to force anything. It's very easily, like, easy to twist it. And so I thought, I'm going to try it again. And I, I sat down and tore the spoon to bend for, like, 10 minutes and started to twist it. But I just couldn't. I, I knew if I really wanted to, I could with force I could turn it but Mm -hmm. that's not what it's all about so I was just not able to let go of the intention and then I thought I'm gonna try it one more time and I was sitting in my room my children are playing outside I'm talking to my I'm almost shouting at this point (laughs) to the spoon (laughs) to the spoon bend 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 and then I hear my children laughing outside, like really loud. 
So I went to the window with the spoon in my hand and looked at like, oh, what are they doing? And then I'm looking and then I remembered, oh, I have the spoon. And then I tried bending it. And to my amazement, it really was like rubber. It was so easy. I twisted, 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 and I twisted it about four times. And it, it was just shockingly easy. Now, what happened is that I was able to completely let go of my intention because I got distracted by what my children were doing. So that's kind of how it works with life. You have to have an intention. You have to have a desire. But you will have to be able to let that go in order for whatever you want to come in your life. And that's why I do the spoon bending with people to make them realize that we don't just focus on what we want. We have to then trust the universe or God or whoever you want to call it, that it will deliver it to you. Because if you keep trying, you're actually blocking it from coming your way. Wow. And that's what spoon bending is really about. I love it. I love it. I want to see one of your spoons. Well, you know, I want to try it too. It's and, great, you Victoria. know, on my website, actually, there is a picture of several of these spoons. Oh, there is? So, yes. Okay. I will go looking. VictoriaSanto.com. Well, Victoria, I've enjoyed talking to you. Do you have any, let's see, closing words or some advice or if you were to start speaking right now without giving it much thought, something you want to share to listeners right now? You know, I think if there's one thing I would like to say is that from what I learned from the spirit word is that we have to stop being so serious. And yes, we need to focus on things we want in life, but we are lacking the playfulness and we are just too serious in, you know, focusing what we want and we miss all the things while we're just focused on what we want. And so what I learned from them is to just be okay with what is right now and just trust that good things are coming your way. So that's probably what I would like to tell people, you know, to stop being so serious have a little bit more fun and just trust that the things that you need in your life will come your way. And if it's not what you envisioned, it will be something even better. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. Thank you for well, that. Well, thank you. Yes. Oh, it's been a delight. And for our listener, thank you for listening. As a reminder, you can go to victoriasanto.com. Or if you go to wedontdieradio.com, click on episode 141, you can see who it was that we were talking to this past hour and get the links that we spoke about and definitely the pictures of the spoons. That's really awesome. And as a reminder, I had brought up in the beginning of this interview, check out afterlifestudies.org to find more about the um, event in Scottsdale, Arizona, September 15th through 17th. And I would love to meet you. I'm thinking the first night that we all arrive, we all meet at the bar or in the lobby and get together. And uh, I think it's going to be a very big event. So I'd love to see you there. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that we are so powerful, more powerful than we even know. And life is an education for our soul. And you, my friend, are important. And your life is important. So I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon.